Welcome. We'll give it a moment for folks to come in from the waiting room. Welcome everyone. As you're coming into our um, event tonight, if you would love to share where you are Zooming from tonight in our chat, we would love to see where you all are located. Great. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I am Susanna Hermans, co-owner of Oblong Books in New York's Hudson Valley. And tonight we are so excited to present this conversation between two of our favorite Hudson Valley authors, Elizabeth Cunningham and Kate Johnson. Elizabeth is here tonight to celebrate the 30th anniversary of her classic feminist novel, The Wild Mother, which has been published in a gorgeous new edition from Monkfish Publishing, another Hudson Valley institution. Elizabeth is the daughter of an Episcopal minister and grew up in a rectory next door to an enchanted forest. The Wild Mother begins her lifelong exploration of the way between the worlds, churchyard and wood, myth and history, wild and human. This August will bring the re-release of The Return of the Goddess, another of her early novels. My Life as Prayer, her debut work of nonfiction, is forthcoming this November. She's joined tonight in conversation with Kate Johnson. Kate is an author, counselor, teacher, playwright, performer, and witch. The author of six books, including Witch in the Kitchen and Celebrating the Great Mother, she trained with the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology and has a private practice as an editor and intuitive counselor in the Hudson Valley. Her latest book is Witch Wisdom for Magical Aging, Finding Your Power Through the Changing Seasons. During the event, I'm gonna go ahead and drop links to purchase all of our author's wonderful books in the chat. Uh, we do encourage you supporting our authors by purchasing their books from either Oblong or your local independent bookseller. Um, and if you're watching this after the fact, you can visit oblongbooks.com to make those purchases. And I will mention again, if you, oh, chat is disabled. Thank you for somebody letting me know. I'll see if I can fix that. And um, in the meantime, we have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So we recommend if you have questions for our authors, click the Q&A button, uh, pop your question in there, and we will uh, have a little Q&A at the end of the event. Um, I'm going to leave the two of you to it. Thank you all so much. Well, first I want to say thank you to Susanna and thank you to Oblong Books and thank you everyone at Oblong Books, Helen, Ella, everyone who works there. And it's Independent Booksellers Day this Saturday. So get out there and support your independent booksellers. And I also want to, um, I want to thank Monkfish Book Publishing Company and all and uh, Paul Cohen, my publisher, and also Colin Roth, who designed this beautiful new edition that actually matches my backdrop. We had a long conversation about that. No, he did. I guess he's intuitive. And speaking of intuitive, I want to thank my friend Kate Johnson for being with me tonight. And I was remembering that I once had a dream in which I said to her, we are laugh long friends. So we're laugh long, lifelong friends. Um, she's helped me with so many books and with so much in my life. And we always have good talks. So that's what we're going to do. Well, right back at you. I have to say, I am so thrilled to be here tonight. This, you're one of my favorite people. You're also one of my very favorite authors. And, you know, I love you. So how fun is this? We get to talk about your book which is 30 years old and yet in this gorgeous new edition. So I feel really honored and pleased to be here and I am bubbling over with questions for you. Oh, so good. let's get started. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, you're best known for the Maeve Chronicles, but what the audience may not know is that you've written other earlier works that are absolutely marvelous. I just reread The Wild Mother. It had been 20 years since I've read it and I was, 
I fell in love with it. I could not put it down. So, you know, if, if you haven't read Elizabeth's other novels, please don't wait. There is a treat awaiting you. You can start with The Wild Mother. Soon there'll be the reissue, as Susanna said, of Return of the Goddess. Yeah, so yeah, available at Oblong or wherever books are sold. So can you, you know, for those of us that haven't read The Wild Mother, can you give us a brief synopsis of the book? Ooh, that was one question I wasn't prepared for. Uh, let's see. You about it? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh uh, I thought I was going to tell the story of how I came to write the book. Oh, but you I, are. There's a lot of synopsis. I but if you'd like to tell I'm, the story. You, maybe you should do the synopsis because, oh, no, I do remember. <laughs> Actually, the synopsis is that, um, yeah, the book opens with the, all the human characters, especially the four main characters, wondering about the wild mother because she has disappeared. And um, she lives in the empty land beyond the wall. Uh, you, and they long for her, dread her, um, want to control her, all the different responses that human beings have to the wild, but especially her daughter Ionia has these dim memories of her and draws pictures of her. She's 10 years old in the novel. And so the, the book is divided into four sections. The, approach of the wild mother, the return of the wild mother, the escape of the wild mother, and then something else that I can't remember, but Kate probably knows. Anyway, it's sure, very, yeah. it also um, the part of the origins of the book were, uh, I was, and oh, this is really shocking. It's shocking enough that it's the 30th anniversary of its publication, but in fact, I started writing it in 1976. And I finished it in 1979. And I am going to tell the story of how I came to write it. But one of the sparks for it, speaking of, um, you know, synopsis, is that the wild mother's name is Lilith. And two of the human characters are named Adam and Eva. And um, I think some of you may be familiar with Judith Plaskow, if that's how you say her name. And she wrote a little brief midrash that was published in one of her books. And it was about... What if Lilith wasn't cast out of the Garden Eden? She's a pro uh, an apocryphal biblical character that, and that I learned about her from C.S. Lewis, actually. But what if she wasn't cast out? What if she said, enough already, I'm out of here, and climbed over the wall? And Judith Plaskow's other, I think, but her main premise was, what if she came back and looked over the wall and talked to Eve and they made an alliance? So that was part of the, I don't think that was necessarily the original. I don't know. I really can't remember, but definitely. And people would say, well, what is this? This isn't, um, you know, this isn't fantasy sci-fi. This isn't realistic, but it is realistic. What is it? And that caused me a lot of problem in the publishing world. But um, one of the things that to, the word that Judith Plasco gave me is midrash which means if there is in the scripture some gap or something unexplained, um, which there is, then you can make up a story and you should make up a story. So in some ways, I feel like most of my work is Midrash. And this is definitely not an allegorical or strict retelling of it. It just so happens that there is Adam, Eva, and Lilith. And two wonderful children and one not so wonderful child. Your child characters are fabulous. Oh, yeah. And that was another thing they told me back in the day. You can't have children and adults in the same novel. Who is this for? Well, tell that to Charles Dickens, please. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, but, and that sort of leads us to the next thing. You are a storyteller. So I do want to hear the story. And I'm sure everyone else does of how you came to write this book. Because it's yeah. a real corker. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a good story. And I think it may speak to many writers and many people. Um, I knew I wanted to be a writer, probably from about the age of 10. And I had journals and I had this and I had that, but I didn't have a form. I didn't know what I was going to write. And it was getting on for my last year of college. So I thought, well, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to take a creative writing course. But I had to get enough credit so that I could take this elective, long, complicated story of my college career, which you can read in my life as a prayer. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna, and guess what? You had to apply to this course. 
So I wrote one really super long short story in my life that probably should have been a novel. So I submitted it and it was rejected. And I had gone to summer school and everything so that I could clear enough room in my schedule to take a creative writing course. And now I couldn't take it because I was rejected. So I, I had a, a wonderful American literature um, section person. That's what they called them. They're like, you know, graduate student teachers. And uh, he and I just, you know, I decided I don't need this credit. So I'm not going to not going to take another course, not going to take a fourth course. And I asked him if he would be my mentor. And he said, yes. And I proceeded to write a lot of drivel. Because I thought, oh, well, I didn't know what I was writing about. So I tried to write all these realistic stories about things that, um, you know, I really I had nothing to say about. But I just kept writing and writing and they kept getting stuck and stuck and they were awful. And a really, really important thing was that I let him see them. And they were so bad that he didn't even critique them. He just sort of set them aside. And he looked at me and he said, you should think about fairy tale. There are only five or six plots in the world. Go home and think about fairy tale. So that's what I did. I was living alone in the hills of Somerville and I went home and I thought about fairy tale and I did things like look at my heather plant and I remembered how when I was a child you'd look at a bed of moss and you'd change it into a forest in your mind. And I looked at my walls and they had the map of make-believe hanging on them. And I just thought about fairy tale and I thought about fairy tale plot and it made a lot of sense. And then I went to school on Monday and I remember walking down the hill to the main street and the gutter that had glass in it and the garbage and everything. And while I walked, all the characters came to me. I knew that there was a girl who was missing her mother. And then all six of the human characters and Lilith came to me and the plot pretty much came to me. Not that I knew exactly what I was doing. It took me three years to write it, but, um, it all came to me by the time I got to school because the right person at the right time said those words and because I dared to fail and I was rejected. And that's how my writing life started. I mean, not that I hadn't been writing before, but that's how I came to write my first novel and discover what my genre really is. That's inspiring because, you know, rejection is part of a writer's life and it's a very painful part. But I love what you say, unless you had been willing to fail, who knows what would have happened? And you were willing, and now look at you. I mean, this the next book that's coming out, My Life is a Prayer, is that number nine for you, not counting the poetry collections? I think it is. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> okay, well, it's something that's I mean, eight or nine. You know, when you see some people's other works, there's like 20 or 30 of them in all different genres, but there's <laughs> four Maeve Chronicles. There's three early books that have been published. There's two books that are going to be reprinted that came after the Maeve Chronicles. There's some poetry collections that are out of print. As I don't know if anybody's counting, but yeah, it's probably nine, ten, something. I don't know. I'm not really good at counting, except that I really love counting symbol, symbol, syllables in haiku and any form that has syllables to align. I like to count that. I don't like to count calories. I don't like to measure <laughs> my um, shots, but I do like to count samples. So here's the thing. This book was really the start of your oeuvre, right? So however many books there are, this was, it was really the beginning. It was one. absolutely yeah. the beginning. Yeah. I was 22 years old. Right, you were a baby. But a what baby. I saw when I reread it is that there is a through line that starts here and goes all throughout your other books. Do you feel like talking a little about some of those through lines? Yeah, I've often thought about that. I mean, there's the wild mother and there's um, a little girl. She's not little, she's 10. So there's a mother daughter thing. That's one thing. And then I remember when I was writing the Maeve and you know, in this story, I don't want to do too many spoilers but basically Ionia has to go out from the human world into the wild and then, it did dawn on me when I was writing 
um, Magdalene Rising, the first book of the Maeve Chronicles, oh, here's a daughter living in the wild with all the wild women who's going to make the reverse journey into the human world. And I, Maeve is pretty wild. So when I was writing her first book, I thought, okay, okay, here's the wild daughter. So that's one through line. I also think that, um, I think in the introduction that Susanna gave, there's this thing of there's there's these worlds and you go between them. And I think I've always been um, trying to work out that relationship. And it really did start with churchyard woods, um, fairy tale scripture. And so I think that's another through line. I think that I began working on that theme then, and I've it's gone through really different stages and developments. And I think in the wild mother, the wild was this wonderful other thing. And I think more and more as I grow older and as I write, as I've written more and more books and as I've had more and more life, I really try to think, well, I'm, we're what, we forgot we're wild too. You know, we talk about nature as if we weren't nature. We are nature. Our bodies are as wild as anything. I mean, they really are. So, uh, but that was my beginning of really trying to, you know, I really like the fact that the word question has quest at its root. So I think in a way there's been a lifelong quest and there's been many adventures and the wild mother was the first one. You also have some through lines with characters. Yeah. which I was really intrigued to see. I had forgotten, I don't, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but there is a male character in The Wild Mother that you just absolutely love to hate, okay? His name is Ab. Oh, he's totally anti-feminist, a mansplainer to the nines, loathed him. Um, and there've been other really loathsome male characters in your books. But one thing I've noticed is that you redeem them, which I think is very generous and very humane of you. Do you want to talk at all about the inspiration for that character or? Well, so some of the father figures in your books. I think that um, one of the things about the wild mother was, I mean, I suppose I'd probably been in therapy even by then, but I did not consciously think I've got father issues up the kazoo. But obviously, if you read all my books, you know that I do. So, and I, and I, I came out raging at the patriarchy. Another story is that uh, my birth, I was a healthy full-term child, but um, I was induced for no reason except that it was my father's schedule it worked for. So I think I really do think I came out raging at the patriarchy and I um, did not like God the Father. I still have a hard time with God the Father. Um, you will read in many, in a couple of my books in my life as a prayer, you'll read the story of how I plotted to kill that, kill God. And Jesus, I made friends with him later, but you know, I had it in for the patriarchy. I had it in for God. Um, and you certainly see that, although I don't think Adam really resembles my father or any man that I knew, he, he's my, that's my first attempt to grapple with that. And I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm kind of into redemption because it's part of my um, heritage. But it was tough. It was really tough. And he had to be confronted with his own evil. But there's a funny story about um, the about through lines. Um, not that Paul of Tarsus, St. Paul, was a he was not a father figure character. He was not an important. He wasn't as important as all my other father characters in all my other books. But he was a minor. He was a minor character. <laughs> Put him in his place. <laughs> he was a major minor character. And he was. I tried to do him, you know, be fair to him because he has some good turns of phrase, but, um, you know, he was a real, and, um, but at one point he and Maeve do join forces and they really are natural enemies, but they join forces at one point to do something heroic together. And my publisher, I'll never forget this. I don't know if he remembers it, but he said to me, yeah, how to go and redeem him, didn't you? <laughs> So I don't know, have it. <laughs> might be a little bit of a compulsion and it might be because as much as I have, um, I have different, I have really deep Christian roots, even though I've also become um, a very, you know, a priestess and an earth-centered pagan and 
uh, whatever it is I am now, who knows? But that's pretty deep. That runs pretty deep. The idea that of confronting evil and somehow through confrontation and wrestling with it and through people wrestling with it in themselves, that some glimmer of redemption comes. And don't ask me what I believe about that, but I seem to have to have written about it quite a bit. A delight to read. Yeah, yeah. Because my work right now is focusing very much on aging and, you know, being a woman in a culture that doesn't like us no matter what age we are, but especially when we're old. I was so taken by the character of grammar, the grandmother, and I recognized the through line there that you have other marvelous grandmother characters in your other books. Do you feel like talking about that? Sure. Um, the grammar was very much based, I mean, in, the, in that book, I don't think anybody except for grammar was really based on a someone that I knew, but grammar really was based on my grandmother who, and you know, you see in the beginning, she's trying, she tries to clean everything. She needs to clean the yard. She needs to clean everything. And my mother, Nana, who she's grammar's based on was my mother's mother-in-law. And instead of getting, you know, threatened or torqued by her mother-in-law coming over and wanting to clean things, she would say, Nana, I've saved this closet for you, or here's this drawer. You can sort it. But she was very, she was funny. She was a very comic character. Um, she was a minister's wife too, because there's all those ministers in my background. Nana, who grammar is based on, played solitaire a lot and she cheated. And so does grammar. But grammar is, you know, she's very horrified by Lilith, by the wildness. She's one who's really and terrified of it and an enemy of it and wants to put it in it its place and can't bear it and sees Lilith as a threat to everything in her life and who's going to take her children, but they end up being allies. And that was a beautiful alliance. And okay. yes, there are a lot of, there's that in, um, what is it? How to spin gold. There's an um, old wise woman in the woods. What else did I write? Oh yeah. Return of the goddess. There's an old woman, you know, who an old grand dame. And I think in all in most of the Maeve Chronicles, until Maeve herself becomes the gray hag, there are um, old women who are wild, um, rambunctious, irreverent, prophetic, holy, all of that. And I rem in in Magdalene Rising, Maeve and Jesus are always arguing. And Jesus at one point says to her, You and your old women, they give you all the answers. You cheat. So there's all these old women, including now in the fairy tale book that I'm writing, there are four elemental grannies who can't actually remember who they are. They have a little bit of dementia, perhaps. So it is a through line for sure. Well, you have significant older women in your own life. And I, I know you write about that in My Life is a Prayer. Um, but I'd love to hear more about that. You had mentioned when we were getting ready for this event that Betty Sang was someone very special to you and that you actually started writing this book, The Wild Mother, at her house. Tell us more about that. Yes, you will read, you will hear a portrait of her in um, My Life as a Prayer. She was one of my father's parishioners and she was older than my parents and she had this soft white hair and she's always seemed to be sitting in a shaft of light like the light was coming through the lost shepherd holding the sheep and it was landing right on her but she was um she was a really she had been an army a nurse in world war ii she um and her she had grown up partly in france and england and the united states and there was something very i mean she came from another generation and she what it was about her, because my father was very much the social gospel and, you know, action, social action. And if you don't have that, then the rest of it doesn't mean anything. And I think she was the first contemplative Christian I ever met. She was the, she was very quiet. And she we went to her house for dinner one day when I was a teenager. And I thought, oh. Oh, the way you set a table or put or um, serve someone something, or the way you cook, or the way the light falls in your room that you've made, or the or your garden, all of that. I said, oh, that's grace. It's not all words. It's not all action. It's a way of being. And that was profound for me to meet that person. And so I decided that 
I don't know how I, I made my way into her life. I mean, I, I kind of didn't give her a whole lot of choice, but to adopt me at a time in my life when I really needed that, when I really needed that kind of love and care and that kind of vision of what could be. So I spent a lot of time with her. Um, I went to France with, I mean, I was a problem child. I get kicked out of school. That's probably for another time. But anyway, I was so in her life and I had done so much with her that when I, um, I was told that I had carte blanche to write whatever I wanted to write, I went on spring break and stayed at her house, which is this beautiful old house with those kind of low eaves and the windows that are low to the floor and, um, four poster beds with feather coverlets and satin coverlets. And it was a beautiful, magical house. And I went to her house and that's where I wrote the first two chapters of The Wild Mother. And my um, mentor, my American literature mentor said, you know, you don't have to write a term paper, write whatever you want. So I wrote the first two chapters of The Wild Mother and I brought them back and he said, that, that's it. You don't have to do anything else. And so, and when I um, left school that year, I went to live with her for the summer because I thought I was going to write a book in the summer. And then I was going to get a job on a cargo ship and travel around the world. It didn't work out that way, but I did spend the summer with her writing the book. And then I did, uh, you know, I moved and did other things. But yeah, she was very much a part of, of that. I'm trying to think, well, who is she in the books? she's just there she permeates everything she wasn't in the wild mother but she was the ground for the wild mother so we talked about through lines that started here and then evolved and I mean how has your if you were to reread it how would you say your thinking has evolved if I since were you wrote this it's which I have years I know right <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, I've been dipping into it to try to find literary Tuesday quotations because um, there's probably people here who know that I post every Tuesday something from my books, very often from Maeve because it's a lot easier to post in someone's first person voice. But I think one of the things I said before is what's changed for me is not seeing the wild as or nature as other, not seeing wild and human as so distinct as they were. I mean, in this book, Ionia is grappling with, I'm the daughter of the wild mother, but I'm also a human being. What does it mean to be human? And I think that's a pretty good question. I'm not sure. And I don't mind my answer, but I don't, I think I, there's a lot of things I would frame differently. I'm not sorry that I wrote that book that way, but I think it's, like I said, we are wild. We need to remember that we're wild and that we are no better or different from any other wild thing. Our whole culture is really predicated on us being totally separate and yeah. better than. And so we can, you know, do whatever we want with everything else that isn't us. So, yeah. Um, so maybe you've already started to answer this question, but I was wondering, after 30 years, what still rings deeply true for you in the book? I think that I think the thing that we were talking about before a little bit is like those kind of alliances that people make when they think they're enemies. That still rings true. And no, we haven't talked about Ava. We should talk about Ava. Ask me a question about Ava or Eva or whatever her name is. We should talk about her because she is the embodiment. I mean, there's Lilith and there's Ionia and grammar, but um Ava Brooke is a colleague at the University of whatever it is. I mean, she's a she's a professor of fairy tales and he's the professor of alchemy. And I didn't know anything about alchemy then, but I just thought that sounded good. But um, she really represents something. She's very important. Should we talk about her a bit? Ask me something about Ava. Well, I just want to say when I first started reading the book, I had forgotten a lot about how loathsome Adam was. And I had also forgotten how I just wanted to shake Ava and smack her and say, wake up, stop being such a spineless sycophant, for God's sake. And the wonderful thing is she does. There, there is such an arc with the characters. She's the book. one that turns everything around in the totally. She's the one at the transformational moment. So I would say that Ava for me, and I think that maybe a lot of people our age can resonate with this. Um, my mother was a minister's wife. 
um, I think at one point in the Return of the Goddess, um, Fergus describes them the the priest wives as sort of being muted and like dimmed. And my mother was someone who was very very intelligent, very talented, but who had absolutely no sense of her own gifts or that they had any worth. And I mean, Ava's actually has more of a professional life than my mother allowed herself to have. But that sort of sense of, I think it was not uncommon for women to feel that they didn't, that they had to serve or that they had to be in the background or that um, that they could not assert themselves. So I don't, I think Ava represented that. She represented all the kindness and good heartedness also of those women. I mean, she's the one who nurtured those children when Lilith wasn't there and they had grammar taking care of them and shoving, what did she use to feed them? Liver. <laughs> I know. Broccoli liver. took care of them and she kept a clean house, but Ava was the one who really was sensitive to them. And, and Ionia loves her. So, and I see she has this, I mean, most of my, I, I often say, well, I became a writer because I don't have any hair and my characters have really good hair. Like Maeve has this gorgeous <laughs> red hair and Lilith has this wild black mane and a lot of them has great hair, but Ava didn't. She had sort of thin um, hair that would always fall in her face that was kind of mouse colored. And so, but she is, she, she finds her strength. And um, yes. I think that there's a through line there too, because in the return of the goddess, Esther was literally a priest wife. That's who Fergus refers to. And she was very much in that kind of role. And she also had to step into her power. So that's okay. important. Ava's really important. So, and, 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 I, and going back to Rosemary, uh, no, Judith Plaskow, that also was what really touched me in her midrash was that Lilith and Ava became allies. And as my sure Lilith do too, but Ava and Lilith, that's really important. It's like they embrace each other. Well, you know, and to a lesser extent, Adam's son goes through a big transformation. Yes, we shouldn't forget about Jason. Don't let's, because yeah, again, a character. And Fred, that Fred is adorable. Fred's oh, Fred's precious. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are a lot of characters to love in this book, even though you start by hating them. At least I did. I yeah. didn't like Grammar when I first met her. I thought she was just stiff, rigid, and, you know, compulsively cleaning all the time. And by the end, she was like Mother Courage. She was yeah. so brave and so dear. And yeah, Jason, he starts out just like dear old dad. He's obnoxious. He knows it all. He thinks yeah. women are in Adam is not his father. He has his father was a hero. And is in a cemetery. I mean, he brags about that, and he um, he taunts um, he taunts Ionia because he says, "Well, I know who my father is, but you don't know who your mother is." Father is in a funny way, though. He seems very clearly to be Adam's son. I mean, on a spirit level, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Because he's he's standing up for big, basically the patriarchy, and and, and the learns. inferiority of women, just as Adam does. Even though you're right, they're not related at all. And he gets yeah. thrown now into the wild. But even before then, he really, he be, he come, he becomes an ally. Does in his yeah. own way. At first, it's just to prove how smart he is, which is kind of annoying. But by the end, he is a true ally. Yeah. So there is all this sort of redemption going on I'm and, uh, no. and yes. opening of hearts toward yeah. people. Because at first, I was very close to several of them. And by the end, I just loved them. So maybe that's going to be my next question. What? I mean, this is a maybe a silly question, but what do you believe the novel offers to a reader? Or maybe I should say. I think you should say, since you just read it. Well, what does the all, novel offer to a reader? Because, I mean, you've read it again after a long yeah, period of time. I just some finished rereading it. Yeah. And some people are reading it for the first time. I'm going to be talking with Barbara McHugh, who's a fellow monkfish writer, who's the author of Bride of the Buddha, which if you haven't read it, you should. Also, if you haven't read Kate's books, you should. But Bride of the Buddha is a great novel. Anyway, Barbara um, and I met basically as monkfish authors, and she read it for the first time. And I'd be curious to see what her questions are. But um, But you've read it. After a period of now. Time. So tell me what, and, and that's an interesting question too, not only for an author to look back and say, who was I when I was 22? But I think that's also true for readers that you read a book at a certain age and then you read it later and it says different things to you. So I would love if you would speak to that. Like, what's it like to read it as a younger person? What's it like to read it now? 
Well, for one thing, I've become so much more judgmental in my old age. So as I said, I was very close to many of the characters. I don't remember being as close to them when I was a young woman reading it. So, okay, what does it offer? Let me start with the writing. The writing is so beautiful. It sweeps us away and takes us into wonderful worlds that you just want to live in. As with all of your novels, Elizabeth, I'm always so sad when they're over. I don't want them to be done. I don't want to have finished reading it. I want to go right back into those worlds. And the worlds are so opposing in this book. I mean, there's yeah. there's the, the sort of castle-like atmosphere of Adam's house. And then there's the wild, which is sort of formless almost, hills and ponds. And But you take Heavily us there. Heavily influenced by the Scottish Highlands that I roamed when I was 17. Yeah. I've always wanted to go. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's that. There's the writing. There's the language, which is it just makes fireworks go off in your head. You have a gift for language. We know this. Your, the story is gripping. I honestly could not put it down. I had to know. I'd forgotten. It's been 20 years. I'd forgotten what happens. And I had to know. You care about the characters. That's another thing that you give us. A real deep appreciation for the complexities of the human spirit which can start off kind of obnoxious or rigid or patriarchal or whatever. But by the end, they've changed. They've shifted. It gives me hope for humanity, actually, you know, that people can change and they can improve and they can open and they can soften. So I don't know if I answered my own question, but I'm just here yes, to tell you. Yes, you did. That was for, you did answer it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank well, you so much. Yeah. Well, if, if y'all haven't read it, just rush right out, click the button on the oblong site because it's just, it's a treat. And, uh, and yeah, it just, it leaves you with a hopefulness about humanity, which goodness knows we need right now. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as a reader, not necessarily as a reader of this book, but as a reader of fiction and poetry and books like yours, that I, you know, I have a whole thing, which maybe you'll get when you read my life as a prayer of feeling like writing doesn't do anything. Writing isn't action. Writing isn't service. Writing is in self-indulgence. But then I remind myself that when I read other people's work, that's exactly what I read for. I read for being opened. I read for being um, challenged. I read for being part of a different world and a different life than I know myself. And I think that um, that is what fiction does. I mean, I've never been, I, what do we really know? They say, write what you know, and it's really great when someone does that. But um, I also say, write what you want to know, what, write what you want to find out. And I love reading books by authors that know things and live things that I, I probably never will live, but because they're going here, they're going to the heart and they're going to the imagination, then I am changed. So that Absolutely. is what I really hope. I, I'm, I hope people get that from all of their reading. And I think, you know, all art does that. All art can do that. Music, film, um, it's essential. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think you just spoke very eloquently about it. This thing about, you know, writing is self-indulgent. We know where that came from. That was from Dear Old Dad. Dear Old and Dad. That's too yep. bad. Yeah, because that's who also gorgeous. gets redeemed in all the perils of this night, by the way. Ah, wow, you did a good job with that because he was yeah. hard to redeem. He but was let's redeemed. talk about let's talk about your relationship with your mother for a minute. You've mentioned that she never really was able to express who she was, even though she was very intelligent and skilled at many things. And she was about that? Our, I mean, I think that well, my mother had many loves that I think that she didn't recognize were also talents. I mean, she loved music. My sister's an incredible musician. I think my, that lineage came to a flowering in my sister. She is, I believe that she was an artist um, and that came to a flowering in my brother and my sister. They're both incredible photographers. Um, and, but she would, she totally disavowed the verbal and she would say, oh, you're like your father, you're like your father, you're like your father. But then I don't think that was actually true. She's the one who read me the stories. And also she is the one who I had migraine headaches when I was a child. And <clears throat> when I was getting over them, I mean, they were really severe. My mother is the one who would make up stories for me about my stuffed animals. Oh. So my mother never acknowledged that she had a gift for story, but she had many, many gifts. And I think that 
she really in the she comes out in so many of the characters in Ava in the in the wife and return of the goddess and also I mean then the the murder at the rummage sale and all the perils of this night that will come out next year she is Anne and um, she's a very complex person uh, because so much of her was held in and because she had kind of some tragic circumstances in her life I realized as I wrote about her that uh, that cold depression that she sometimes had was was hot molten rage but that couldn't come out but what she did do was she certainly encouraged us and our gifts and I think she was the first person I said to when I was I don't know how old I was but it was way before the wild mother I said I think I really want to write novels and she said because that's what I love to read and she said I think you will oh so she so gave you her blessing in a she way she did and then she withdrew it when I became but that's a whole other story which you can read in my life as a prayer but it was complicated in her world you could not be a creator and be a mother you had to choose so as long as I wasn't a mother then she was my best fan um also Miss Sang and um my mother liked the wild mother they liked um how to spend gold but where well, they could it's good that they didn't have to really deal with Maeve because I think she would have been my mother, yes. my mother not my cup of tea dear <laughs> oh god that's so funny. I mean as soon as I started writing the return of the goddess my mother was like not my cup of tea it's just not my cup of tea so Fortunately, they didn't have to suffer. Well, they did suffer with the return of the goddess, but Maeve was just on the loose. She didn't have to, she could do whatever she wanted. Well, that's nice that she had that freedom that you were thinking about your mother freedom, and I saying. Freedom, but uh, it is interesting to know that my biggest fans and supporters probably would not have loved where my work eventually went, even though, as you say, there are many through lines. One thing that I'm seeing, too, is the complexity, not only of your parents as characters or as people, but of the characters that you write. They are not cardboard. They are multidimensional and very human. Even, even the wild mother in her own way, is, she's not yeah. human, she's wild, but she has sides to her yeah. and has feelings that you don't expect that she's going to have. I think all of them undergo an evolution. And yeah. maybe that is one of the big through lines in all of your books. Is that the I characters, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was cool. hard to write Adam because I to write from inside Adam was really hard because I thought he was a, I, I was afraid he was a cardboard villain but I guess he isn't and Lilith it was interesting one of the narrative choices that I made and maybe this is a thing that about beginning my life as a novelist one of the things that I choose as a novelist in each book is what is the point of view going to be so in The Wild Mother, all the six human characters have their, you know, in some, whatever scene you're in, you know whose mind you're in. And only Lilith does not have, only Lilith is seen by all of them from their point of view, but not, she, you don't get to see her from her point of view. And that was deliberate. That was a deliberate narrative choice. And then of course, Maeve went on at the mouth for four volumes in first person, which you know, it was not good to use the first person if you were my father's daughter. You were not supposed to use the word I. And I guess Maeve showed him. But um I but sure did. <laughs> sometimes but it was really interesting in Maeve, you know, even though she was a first person character, to try to get other points of view in. Because I love that there are that is what novelists have to give to the world. There's more than one story in any story, and there's more than one point of view always. And that is, yeah, that's the purpose of novelists on earth is to remind us of that. And I think now we're at our Q&A time. Are is there any last question or comment that you have before we go to that, Kate? No, thank I just you wondered so if you had great. any, well, thank you. This was really fun. I just wondered if you had any closing remarks that you wanted to make about The Wild Mother or about your entire oeuvre, which, yeah, there are books in the pipeline. So yeah, be aware. They're coming well, out in August and November. It's been wonderful to live I, all these other lives and I think that it's been a kind of salvation and redemption for me yeah beautiful well, I'm I'm back with some questions from our our viewers um if you have a question for Elizabeth you can drop it in the chat or use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen 
So our first question is from Donna, and she said that you had mentioned uh, that there were only four or five fairy tale plots. Um, and Donna was wondering if you could tell us what they are. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> but in it's a fair. way, well, what I did, uh, that's not a fair answer. What I did when, when I was told that was I thought about that. I don't know what the four or five plots are, but I know what inspired me, which, okay, one of the plots I think is loss and quest. And of course, one of the plots is having to, and we know in a lot of fairy tales, you have to overcome many obstacles. And it, uh, sometimes they say to people, you know, don't, you know, you tell him to go climb a glass mountain. Don't make things so, you know, like there's that. There's like having to do tasks. The other thing that I like about fairy tales, and I didn't mean to be flip at the beginning, Donna, I'm sorry about that. That I really like about fairy tales, if you think about a lot of fairy tales, in uh, many of them, the youngest daughter or the youngest son or whoever the hero is, is very unprepossessing, doesn't think much of themselves, and they're going along, and they come upon a beggar or an animal that's hurt, and they stop to help, even though the other people say, no, no, you have to keep going, don't stop, don't do that, don't be kind, get, get where you want to go, and they stop and they help. And then later that out, they get their magical allies. So if you, I think the best thing to do about really finding plot in fairy tale is to read a lot of them and then identify it. So for me, it was like, I don't know who my mother is. I don't know where she is. So it was loss and reunion. I think that's a big one. I think Beautiful. fairy tales all were sort of designed to teach us how to be the best humans we can be. I mean, that whole theme of being kind, that's huge. You don't hear much about that anymore. You know, and I think it's a it's a really worthy uh, goal for all of us. Yeah, you should talk fun. a little bit about Baba Yaga, Kate. Oh gosh, Baba Yaga, she's not kind. Um, you know, to look at her, she's a Russian fairy tale character, and she's really scary. And if people come to see her and they don't follow her rules and they're not respectful to her as they should be, because she's this wonderfully wild hag, then you know they end up being breakfast for her. But if <laughs> If you follow her rules and if you give her the proper respect, she gives you what you need. And I just think she's marvelous. So she teaches bravery and courage as well as respect. So trial and transformation are two words that just came to me as basic plot lines for fairy tales. Our next question comes from Rebecca. Rebecca asks, how do you view that experience, that experience of characters coming to you? I just view it as grace. I mean, it's, I think that that is, this is one of the most wonderful things. I'm not sure I can completely explain it, but it is one of the best things that's happened to me in my life. And I realized that sometimes, I think it's partly about when you're writing, or when you're telling a story, you go into a different, uh, probably there's a scientific explanation brain waves or whatever but I've also noticed that when I'm listening deeply in a you know counseling session or something stuff comes in that seems like it's not and I, I don't like the word channel particularly because I think it's more like a partnership it's not just like everything's downloaded it's more like okay oh she showed up okay I'll work with her that's what it feels like to me it's like stuff comes in because your own consciousness shifts I can't, and some characters that I've written about that I love, I actually did know in life, like my grandmother, like Marvin in Return of the Goddess, and some just came to me, like Maeve, and um, I just think it's a great mystery, and I don't really know, but thank everything, thank all that is that it happens. And I think it can happen for all of us. You don't just have to write a novel. I mean, often I say, like, we have a host of characters inside us. And sometimes it's fun to say, oh, that's that part of me and to even give it a name. And then you can talk to it instead of be bossed around by it or suppressing it. It's not schizophrenia, folks, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite, really. It's more like integration. It's like raising to consciousness all the different parts of yourself because if you don't raise them to consciousness, it's like, it's easy to not know who you are. Or who's really driving the train. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of times the most judgmental or critical part of ourselves gets way too much airtime. So then I say to people, make up a fairy godmother because you really need that voice. 
I think that segues nice, nicely into our question from Barbara McHugh, whose book you so nicely plugged a little earlier. Um, Barbara says, uh, you said you made a conscious choice not to write in Lilith's point of view. What was the reason for this? I, th I want, because I think at that time, although I've said I've kind of evolved in how I think about the wild, I wanted there to be something inviolate about, and then maybe that's, I still think that she's like a wilderness, she's inviolate. So people are in relationship to her, but she is the wild. And so I wanted her to, and I mean, now I might well want to write from, and I am sort of right now, I'm really trying to write from the point of view of earth, air, fire, and water some of the time. Um, I'm, I'm playing with that relationship differently, but I wanted Lilith to be what all the other human characters had to come to terms with. And I wish all of us human characters now on the earth would do that actually. <laughs> Rose is asking, does a story or poem nag and nag you until you write it down and set it free? I'm the, I probably um, am pretty cooperative if one wants to come, but I've heard of people saying that, and I think that's something to pay attention to. If something's really, really tapping on your shoulder and, you know, turn around and say, okay, what do you, oh yeah, actually nagging. Yes, I would feel, I would say that in some ways the goddess presented in that way I mean I can't remember when I first encountered it and when I started writing the wild um not wild mother the return of the goddess but I remember saying to that horse that she is what do you want from my life what who are you what do you want so yeah I think nagging can come into it and then I think just form a relationship and if you really don't want to write it or don't want that poem say go away and it probably will but I can't imagine that you really want to do that I wouldn't so <laughs> Yeah. We have time for a couple more questions if anyone has burning questions they'd like Elizabeth to answer uh, about books or life, perhaps. Um, Tom <laughs> is wondering, Elizabeth, who are your favorite writers? Oh, wow. I I'm really bad about remembering names and titles, but of course, a very formative influence on me was C.S. Lewis and uh, Narnia. But I have, um, oh gosh, I, I've started to write down books that I've just read. Right now I'm reading a really raunchy mystery set in Dublin that with lots of foul language in Irish vernacular. And I'm really loving that. What did I read before? I really, I read widely and I, I read in different genres. And basically what I want is to be transported. I want to be taken somewhere out of myself and out of my own world. And it doesn't have to be fantastical. It just has to be compelling. So, and I'm, I'm sorry, next time I should really write down, well, I, you know what? One novel I really loved is Ride of the Buddha. And that, that novel had all those qualities for me. And also, well, we won't, Barbara and I will discuss Buddhism in a couple of weeks, but Barbara really did give me an insight into it that I never had before, an insight in, I made friends with that religion in a way that I never had before. And I love that. I'll ask the question to tie into what you just said. What is, what has the, the work of friendship between authors been for you over these, this amazing career that you've had? Oh, uh, well, there's Kate and, um, all the people that, and Tom and Jack and um, Catherine McCoon and, and now Barbara, I've just recently met. I think it's really always lovely when you have a craft to know other people who have a craft. And the late Rachel Pollock, I didn't know her well, but she was very, very kind to me and um, to many people. And I think that I think that I've never been part of writing groups uh, I though I have been part of a poetry group which was great which Kate started and that was what's that, and what I liked about that was we weren't reading things to critique them we were writing on the spot and sharing and that created a lot of camaraderie so but a lot of as everybody knows there's a lot of time you spend just sitting there with the blank page with the blank screen so it is good to talk to people. Oh, and, and Robert Wexelblatt, who you will hear about in my life as a prayer. And he's another story from my college years. He was a wonderful mentor and teacher. 
And he's also a writer. And I've blurbed his books and he's blurbed my books. And he has been a he's been a companion on the way, as have many people. Beautiful. Well, we've made it through our questions. Do either of you have any sort of parting words or thoughts you want to share before we, we end? I want to thank all my friends and everyone who came and all the people who's writing I know, um, including, I don't know if that was the Rebecca that asked the question, but her writing and everyone's writing, everyone's writing in the poetry circles and everyone who reads and um, my friend Debbie, if she's there, who's um, basically lived inside all my books and helped them come to life. And there's so many people to thank. I, I don't, it's like hard to start thanking people because you don't want to miss anybody, but you are all in my heart. And I do thank, I am thankful for readers every day. And for all the people who support writers in all the ways they, they do as writers and readers and people who go to bookstores and libraries and keep a certain kind of sensibility alive that makes the world a rich and nuanced place. Beautifully said, and I want to echo just that. Thank you to all of you for being open to being transformed and opened up by whatever you read. Uh, we write for you and we love you for reading what we write and what a privilege it is to know other writers who are engaged in this life transforming, world transforming work. Thank you. And Susanna, thank you so much for having oh, us. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you both. This was a truly joyful evening and I'm so glad we were able to share it with so many folks tonight. If you haven't already gotten your hands on a copy of The Wild Mother, you can grab one at oblongbooks.com or ask for it at your local independent bookstore. And also absolutely check out Kate's book, Witch Wisdom for Magical Aging. It's spectacular. Um, and go forth and read and be joyful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>